This is Space Time, Series 23, Episode 4. Coming up on Space Time, a new study which is changing science's understanding of galactic evolution. Astronomers discover that solar specules are caused by magnetic reconnection and the hottest exoplanet ever detected. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. Astronomers have discovered that galactic evolution may have begun much earlier than previously thought. The findings are based on new observations of a distant galaxy some 12.3 billion light years away, which already had a well formed galactic core at a time when the universe was less than 1.5 billion years old. The findings, reported in the Astrophysical Journal Letters, pushes back galactic evolution by at least a billion years. The galaxy the team was studying, which was already more massive than the Milky Way, contained more than a trillion stars. The study's lead author, Masayuki Tanaka, from the National Astronomical Observatory in Japan, says science's understanding of how galaxies form and grow is still quite limited, especially when it comes to really big galaxies. He says that galaxies can be broadly categorized as being either dead or alive. Dead galaxies are no longer forming stars, while living galaxies are still bright with lots of star formation activity. A third type of galaxy, called a quenching galaxy, is one in the process of dying, meaning its star formation is significantly suppressed. Quenching galaxies aren't as bright as fully alive galaxies, but then again they're not as dark as dead galaxies either. Researchers can use this spectrum of brightness as the first line of identification when observing the universe. The authors used the giant 10-metre Keck telescopes on Mauna Kea in Hawaii to observe a quenching galaxy in what's known as the Subaru XMM-Newton Deep Field. This region of the sky has been closely observed by several telescopes, producing a wealth of data for scientists to study. Tanaka and colleagues used an instrument called MOSFIRE on the Keck-1 telescope to obtain new data on the galaxy. They obtained a 2-micron measurement of the near-infrared spectrum. The authors also confirmed that the galaxy's star formation was being suppressed, meaning the galaxy had started to die. But that's exactly the kind of galaxies the authors were looking for in order to understand why quenching occurs. As they studied this distant galaxy, they discovered that its core was already fully formed, at a time when the universe was really still quite young. How stars move within a galaxy depends on how much mass that object contains. Tanaka and his team found that the stars in the distant galaxy seemed to move just as quickly as those closer to home. The previous measurement of this kind was made when the universe was already 2.5 billion years old. That's a billion years closer to where we are now. The authors pushed that record back to 1.5 billion years and were surprised to discover that the core was already mature. The team are now looking for even more massive galaxies at even greater galactic distances and hence earlier back in space-time. This will help scientists better understand how galaxies are born and how they die in this most ancient of times. You're listening to Space Time, still to come the hottest exoplanet ever observed. And later in the science report, the Wellington City Council wins New Zealand's Bent Spoon Award for the worst pseudoscientific piffle of the year. All that and more coming up on Space Time. The European Space Agency's CHEOPS spacecraft has successfully blasted into orbit on a mission to study exoplanets, worlds orbiting stars other than the Sun. CHEOPS, or as ESA likes to call it, CHEOPS, was flown aboard a Russian Soyuz STB rocket equipped with a frigate upper stage from the European Space Agency's Kourou spaceport in French Guiana. À tous de DDO, attention au décompte final. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6... 5, 4, 3, 2, unité, top décollage. Les paramètres au bord sont normaux. Always impressive, no matter how many times you see Soyuz powering into the sky. 309 tons at liftoff, that's less than half the mass of Ariane 5. The boosters are the first stage, the boosters and the central core, or second stage, are burning now, Les paramètres au bord sont conformes à l'attendu. As the DDO says, all is well on board. The boosters weigh 45 tons each at liftoff. Total mass of the first stage, 178 tons. Their engines running on liquid oxygen and kerosene. The same 
same propellants used in each of the three lower stages. Les paramètres propulsifs sont conformes à l'attendu. The second, or the core stage, similar to the boosters, its ignition occurred on the launch pad stage will burn for four minutes. Séparation des quatre propulseurs. At separation of her boosters, she's down to 135 tons. So in less than two minutes, she loses more than half her weight. The uh, data are received by the Russian teams in the launch center, then confirmed before being broadcast. Propulsion Next up is jettison, jettison of the fairing. That's in about 20 seconds. Fairing measures of four meters in diameter, stands about 11 meters tall. We can get rid of it now because we no longer need the protection it gives the satellites during their ride through the Earth's atmosphere. At 100 kilometers up, we are out of the dense layers of the atmosphere. There's no more friction, no more heating, which can disturb the satellites. Signals from the spacecraft received at Mission Control near Madrid by way of the Troll tracking station confirmed that the launch was successful and Cheops was deployed into its correct transfer orbit. It's since been transitioning into a sun-synchronous orbit at an altitude of about 700 kilometres. CHEOPS stands for Characterising Exoplanet Satellite. It's a partnership between ESA and Switzerland to investigate known exoplanets beyond our solar system and provide key insights into the nature of these distant alien worlds. The 300 kilogram spacecraft was built at the University of Bern and uses solar panels that also act as part of its sun shield, providing 60 watts of continuous power for its instruments, which will be downloading around 1.2 gigabytes of data every day. Scientists had long speculated about the existence of exoplanets, but it was all just speculation until the discovery of 51 Pegasi b, the first planet found orbiting around a sun-like star, which was announced in 1995. The discoverers Didier Kulos and Michael Meyer shared the 2019 Nobel Prize in Physics for their breakthrough finding, which marked the beginning of a new era of investigation and turned planet hunting into one of the fastest growing areas of astronomy. Over the past quarter of a century, astronomers using telescopes on Earth and in space have discovered more than 4,000 exoplanets around stars near and far, most of which have no analogues in our solar system. This widely diverse assortment extends from gas giants larger than Jupiter to water worlds, ice giants, and small rocky terrestrial planets covered in lava. This report from ESA TV. By searching beyond the skies, the Geneva Observatory is helping to answer questions about the nature of the universe we live in. In 1995 at the observatory, Michelle Meyer and Didier Kahlo co-discovered the first ever exoplanet orbiting a sun-like star outside our solar system. In these days, I was using a technique that we call radial velocity, which is um, observing a star and looking for any change of speed in the star. Well, since then, the field has just exploded. As, as you may know, there is really now thousands of exoplanets. Um, there are a lot of planets known uh, to be transiting, which means the planet goes right in front of the star. And, um, and that's these techniques that we're using for, for the Kerbs mission. The Kops Space Telescope can measure this tiny dip in light from the star during the transit. Kops's uh, aim is to measure the size of already known exoplanets. So it's not a discovery mission. It is really aimed at precisely measure the size. And once we have the size and possibly the mass, we can derive the mean density. And from then we know a little bit what the planet is made of. The exoplanets to be observed by Kops are typically small and range from rocky and hot to gaseous like Jupiter with possible Earth-like planets in between. Many have been discovered at much closer distances to their host star than those in our solar system, some taking just a few days to complete an orbit. There are differences too in how today's search for exoplanets is conducted, with space-based facilities complementing ground-based telescopes, and racks of computers to process data from targeted stars and exoplanets. The observatory also houses the KEOPS Science Operations Centre. We're sending the observation program to the Mission Operations Centre in, in uh, Madrid, 
uh, where then the information is uplinked to the actual instrument. The instrument is configured to observe the, the star, and then the telemetry, the data is downlinked uh, to the mission operations center and right away forwarded to us here in Geneva, where we then can do the data processing, uh, archive the data, and then provide it to the scientists uh, all over Europe and to the world. The Compact Science Operations Centre at the heart of the mission also reflects the compact size of Cheops's telescope. It is just one and a half metres long, but will punch well above its weight and size. There are now over 4,000 known exoplanets and counting, and through repeated observations of several hundred of them, the mission will provide an important insight into the inner structure of exoplanets, how they form, and evolve. And that report from Easter TV featured Didier Kulas, chair of the CHEOPS science team, as well as Michael Meyer from the University of Geneva, CHEOPS principal investigator Willie Benz from the University of Bern, and CHEOPS ground segment manager Matthias Beck from the University of Geneva. CHEOPS will examine hundreds of transiting exoplanets, following up on existing exoplanetary discoveries, undertaking detailed observations of their size, mass and likely composition, thereby allowing scientists to work out how they formed and evolved. The mission will observe these planets exactly as they transit in front of the host stars, blocking out a tiny fraction of the star's light and allowing the probe to measure their sizes with unprecedented precision and accuracy. This data will be combined with ground-based spectroscopic surveys, which have already provided mass estimates. See, knowing both the mass and size of an exoplanet lets astronomers determine the planet's average density, and thus estimate its general composition, whether it's a terrestrial planet like the Earth, a water world, or a gas giant. Cheops should be especially good at spotting shallow transits, and for determining accurate radii for known exoplanets in the super-Earth to Neptune mass range, which includes objects between 1 and 6 Earth radii. For some planets, Cheops will be able to reveal details about their atmospheres, including the presence of clouds and possibly even hints at cloud composition. The mission also has the capability of discovering previously unknown exoplanets by measuring tiny variations in the timing of the transits of known planets and can also be used to search for moons or even rings around some planets. By revealing the mysteries of these distant alien worlds, Cheops will take science a step closer to answering one of the most profound questions of humanity, whether or not we are alone in the universe. Cheops' mission won't be easy. Both its instruments and the spacecraft itself have been designed and built to be extremely stable, so as to measure the incredibly small variation in the light of distant stars as their planets transit in front of them. For an exoplanet similar in size to the Earth, this amounts to the equivalent of watching the Sun from a distant star and measuring its light dim by just a tiny fraction of a percent. This report from ESA TV. Chaos a specialist satellite with a single instrument, a powerful camera or photometer. It'll record the light from stars orbited by known exoplanets. Chaops is designed to investigate what these planets are like. We'll be focusing on smaller planets, so Earth-sized to Neptune-sized planets, which have been found by other missions, such as Kepler, to be very abundant around other, uh, other stars, sun-like stars, something which is not so much the case in our own solar system. So it's a big question. What are these uh, uh, um, smaller planets? What are they made of? Chaops will do this by measuring the variation in light caused when an exoplanet passes in front of its host star. Chaops is about taking the next uh, step uh, in investigating planets beyond uh, our solar system and in particular aims at uh, providing a reliable and accurate measurement of the sites of the planets and from there uh, be able to derive uh, their density and therefore their composition. The Space Telescope will orbit some 700 kilometres above the Earth, with its camera always pointing towards the night side. This will limit the effects of any stray light disturbing its measurements. Chaops is a relatively low-cost and low-risk mission, since all its elements have already been proven in flight. Nevertheless, building a satellite to obtain precise measurements of light from alien stars has been a complex technical challenge. The instrument was designed to be able to perform accurately over long periods of time, and the satellite was designed around the instrument to guarantee these stable conditions. 
As you can see, uh, the satellite has uh, a sun shield protecting the instrument from the direct sun illumination. And this uh, is uh, very important to allow the proper thermal stabilization of the detector inside the instrument. Kops will give us an insight into the nature of these planets and even whether some of them have the potential for life. In doing so, this small satellite will help us take the next step in answering a fundamental question about the universe. Are we alone? Cheops shared its ride into space with the Italian space agency's ASI Cosmos SkyMed second generation satellite, which separated 23 minutes after liftoff. Also on board for the ride was a small test satellite called OPSAT, which was specifically designed to conduct operational experiments in space and includes the most powerful flight computer aboard any of ESA's current spacecraft. We all know consumer electronics here on Earth have gone through a revolution over the last 30 years, with computers becoming even faster, smaller and better. But when it comes to multi-million or even multi-billion dollar missions, their onboard hardware and software hasn't seen this sort of revolution because of the risks involved in testing new technology in spaceflight. Because of this, spacecraft operators dare to fly only tried and tested hardware and software in the harsh conditions of space. Innovation on the operational side of satellites is a very slow-moving process. And this is where OPSAT comes in providing an opportunity to safely test new mission control techniques. New observations suggest that structures on the surface of the Sun known as solar spectrals may be caused by a process called magnetic reconnection. Solar spectrals are ubiquitous jet-like plasma features which punctuate the Sun's atmosphere. Spectrules are erupting continuously across the Sun's vast expanse. They're anywhere between 200 and 500 kilometers wide, jetting out at speeds of over 100 kilometers per second. At any given time, more than a million of these geyser-like spectrules are seen erupting from the photosphere, the Sun's visible surface, and launching columns of plasma high into the Sun's upper atmosphere, the corona. However, the origin of specules and their role in heating the solar corona remain poorly understood, and the multiple theoretical explanations that have been proposed to try and explain their origin are still hotly debated, no pun intended. The findings reported in the journal Science are based on observations suggesting that specules are generated by the release of energy as two magnetic fields snap back into alignment near the solar surface and channel hot plasma into the overlying corona. Although this highly dynamic solar phenomena has been observed from Earth for more than a century, actually studying it's quite difficult because each spectral from formation to collapse usually lasts only a few minutes. It's been speculated that specules may be involved in transferring energy and solar plasma from the Sun's surface to feed the much hotter corona and solar wind. The big problem is that the laws of thermodynamics tell us that things tend to get cooler the further away you get from a heat source. For example, at the Sun's core, where nuclear fusion of hydrogen into helium takes place, the temperature is around 15 million degrees Celsius. But this cools down to just 6,000 degrees Celsius by the time that heat reaches the Sun's surface. It mysteriously heats up again to over a million degrees by the time it reaches the corona. Using unprecedented high-resolution observations from the Big Bear Solar Observatory in California, combined with tracking data from NASA's Solar Dynamics Observatory spacecraft, astronomers were able to show that specules are ejected from the Sun's surface when magnetic fields with opposite polarities reconnect in the Sun's lower atmosphere. Lead author Widner Cheo from Big Bear says it's the first time scientists have seen direct evidence of exactly how specules are generated. Chao and colleagues track the emerging specules at high temporal resolution in the hydrogen alpha spectral line right down to their footpoints, where they measured the magnetic fields, captured the migration of the emerging magnetic elements, and verified their interaction with existing magnetic fields of opposite polarity. The authors discovered that many specules occurred within just a few minutes of the appearance of a patch of reverse polarity magnetic field within the surrounding dominant polarity field. They suggest that the energy released as the two magnetic fields snap back into alignment, a process called magnetic reconnection, is what actually triggers the enhanced specular activity. Meanwhile, simultaneous observations of the overlying corona demonstrated local heating of the sun's upper atmosphere. 
The authors also captured the first high-resolution images of magnetic fields and plasma flows originating deep below the Sun's surface, tracing the evolution of sunspots and magnetic flux ropes through the chromosphere before their dynamic appearance in the corona as flaring loops. You're listening to Space Time. Astronomers have discovered an exoplanet that's so hot, its atmosphere is composed of vaporized heavy metals. The planet, known as Kelt 9b, orbits a late spectral type B blue star known as HD 195689, and obviously also known as Kelt 9, otherwise the planet wouldn't be called Kelt 9b. Kelt 9 is located some 620 light years away in the direction of the constellation Cygnus the Swan. The host star has a surface temperature of around 10,170 Kelvin. That's almost twice as hot as the surface of the Sun. The discovery is remarkable because transiting planets usually aren't detected in orbits around such hot stars. And this planet, Kelt 9b, is what we call a hot Jupiter. It's a gas giant, in this case with about twice the size and three times the mass of Jupiter, the largest planet in our solar system and it orbits extremely close to its host star, taking just one and a half Earth days to complete each orbit. Again, by comparison, the closest planet orbiting our Sun, Mercury, takes 88 Earth days to complete an orbit. Being so close, Kelt 9b is tidally locked to the star, with the same side always facing its host. This gives the planet a dayside surface temperature of somewhere between 4,050 and 4,600 Kelvin. That's better than 3,780 degrees Celsius, and that's actually hotter than the surface of most stars. Now, a report in the journal Astronomy and Astrophysics claims astronomers have detected traces of vaporized sodium, magnesium, chromium, and the rare earth metals scandium and yttrium, as well as signatures for gases iron and titanium in the atmosphere of Kelt 9b. Since the discovery of the first exoplanets in the mid-1990s, well over 4,000 exoplanets have been discovered. And many of these planets are extreme compared to planets in our solar system. But this hot Jupiter Kelt 9b probably represents the most extreme example of any exoplanet. In such extreme heat, all elements are almost completely vaporized, and even the molecules are broken apart into their constituent atoms, similar to the environment in the outer layers of stars. Now this means that the atmosphere contains no clouds or aerosols, and the sky is clear, mostly transparent to light from its host star. Using the HARPS North spectrograph on the Italian National Telescope on the island of La Palma, researchers initially found titanium and iron atoms in the hot atmosphere of Kelt 9b. But it was the follow-up observations which were even more surprising. Not only did they confirm the earlier signatures, but they also detected signatures for 73 other atoms that they didn't see before, including sodium, magnesium and chromium, and the rare earth metals, scandium and yttrium. The study's lead author, Yentry Marcus from the Geneva Observatory, says the latter three of these have never previously been robustly detected in the atmosphere of any exoplanet. Kelt 9b is a very hot gas giant planet. You can imagine it as a planet that is somewhat similar as Jupiter in our own solar system, uh, but it is located very close to its host star. And that itself is not necessarily special, because we know of many planets that are like like this. We call them hot Jupiters. But this planet is orbiting a particularly hot star as well. And that means that it is the hottest exoplanet that we know exists today. So what we have discovered in the atmosphere of Kelt 9b is that it contains, in gaseous form, uh, heavy metals, such as iron, titanium, chromium, and other heavy metals that have never been observed in the atmosphere of a planet before. In the atmosphere of Kelt 9b, we have detected a number of heavy metals, and two of these are what we call rare earth metals, scandium and yttrium, and these have not been observed in the atmosphere of any planet before. To study what the atmosphere of a planet is made of, astronomers make use of a technique called spectroscopy. So the light from the exoplanet system will reach our telescope. And the telescope, instead of making a picture, it will feed the light into the instrument called a spectrograph. And the spectrograph acts to disperse the light into its individual colors, like a rainbow. Now this rainbow will tell us how bright the object is at each of its individual colors. But the material that is present in the planet will absorb colors at very specific 
places. And uh, for many, uh, for many atoms or species, that can be a very complicated pattern of colors that is absorbed. So you can think of that as some sort of a fingerprint. Every atom has its unique pattern of colors or its unique fingerprint that it absorbs. So by passing the light through a spectrograph and seeing at which colors the light is absorbed, we will be able to distinguish which elements are present in the object, even if it's many light years away. The authors are able to use these signals to estimate at what altitude in the planet's atmosphere these atoms are absorbing, and find out more about the strong global wind patterns high up in the atmosphere, which are blowing the material from one hemisphere to the other. The study's co-author, Kevin Heng from the University of Bern, says the chances are good that one day they may even find biosignatures, signs of life, on a distant exoplanet using exactly the same sort of techniques being used here. So one of the reasons why we are so uh, interested, almost obsessed with this technique, is because it's very general. It makes us think of molecules and atoms as fingerprints of an exoplanet. So once you accept that idea, you can use this idea to search for anything you want. In the case of Cal 9 b we searched for metals, but you could imagine in the future that we could use it to search for biosignatures, so signs of life in another exoplanet. That's Kevin Heng from the University of Bern, and before him, Yentry Marcus from the Geneva Observatory. And this is Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. Russia has carried out its final launch of a Rokot rocket. The flight from the Plesetsk Cosmodrome at 800 kilometres north of Moscow carried three GoNets M telecommunications satellites into orbit. The ROCOT is a converted SS-19 Stiletto intercontinental ballistic missile, with its usual thermonuclear warhead removed and replaced with a satellite payload attached to a Breeze KM upper stage. The satellites were eventually placed into a 1500 kilometre high low Earth orbit. The first ROCOT was launched from Plesetsk back in May 2000. Since then, some 30 ROCOTs carrying more than 70 satellites have been launched into orbit. Both the ROCOT booster and the Breeze KM upper stage use highly toxic dimethylhydrazine fuel together with nitrogen tetroxide oxidizer, making them environmentally dangerous. Another problem with Russia using the ROCOT has been the fact that the launcher uses a Ukrainian-developed control system, and Russia and Ukraine aren't exactly on speaking terms at the moment. And time now to take another brief look at some of the other stories making news in science this week with the Science Report. Scientists have put together a 35-year data record charting sea surface temperature changes. The data, which has been published in the journal Nature, includes some 4 trillion satellite measurements of global sea surface temperatures, creating one of the longest continuous global climate data records. The new data set will play a key role in evaluating global models used to predict how our oceans will influence future climate change. The new data set also supplements historic sampling along shipping routes and from ocean-going buoys, which have shown a rise in sea surface temperatures during the 20th century of more than 0.6 degrees Celsius per decade. A new study says the so-called love hormone oxytocin may have a role to play in sex addiction. A report in the journal Epigenetics claims researchers set out to look at the regulation of genes in people with hypersexual disorder, often referred to as sex addiction. They found that there were two regions of DNA that were regulated differently in hypersexual disorder patients. One of these is linked to the control of the hormone oxytocin and has also been found to show altered regulation in people with alcohol addiction. Oxytocin is often referred to as the love hormone, as it's been linked to a host of human behaviours, including sexual arousal, but also recognition, trust, anxiety, and mother-infant bonding. New researchers revealed that Australia's oldest flowering plants arrived on the continent some 126 million years ago, and probably resembled modern magnolias, buttercups and laurels. The findings by scientists with the University of Melbourne also determined that Australia's first blooms probably got their foothold in high southern latitude regions like the Otway and Gippsland Ranges. The research also established that these first flowers are related to 72% of today's living angiosperm species that first appeared in southern Australia around 108 million years ago, some 17 million years after the first flowers evolved in equatorial regions. The world's oldest flower, Montsetia, is 130 million years old and was discovered in Spain. 
Scientists found it was warming temperatures which allowed the first flowering plants to migrate to cooler regions closer to the Earth's poles. Iran says it's about to unveil a new generation of uranium enrichment centrifuges. The move is the latest show of defiance by Tehran against its 2015 nuclear deal. The Islamic Republic recently restarted uranium enrichment at the underground Fordow facility in violation of its nuclear agreements. It's also been preventing United Nations International Atomic Energy Agency inspectors from entering its facilities, another violation of its agreements. Back in September, Iran announced that it was firing up advanced centrifuges that enrich uranium at a faster rate. And in October, it announced plans for more ballistic missile tests as it continues its development of what experts believe is a nuclear weapons delivery system. Scientists have started a new breeding and conservation program to try and save the endangered whites or Sydney seahorse. The project, which is being undertaken by Sea Life Sydney Aquarium and the University of Technology Sydney, aims to successfully breed, raise and release white seahorse back into the wild and then monitor any success in helping to reverse the species' decline. White seahorse's decline is largely due to its loss of natural habitat. So researchers have begun collecting breeding pairs from Sydney Harbour. And this included some pregnant males with several births already confirmed in their new custom-built habitat, which will accommodate the growing juveniles until they're ready for release back into the wild. The long-term aim is to support the overall recovery of the species, with the installation of seahorse hotels across Sydney Harbour. These will encourage the recovery and ongoing breeding of white seahorses, given that so much of their natural seagrass, sponge and soft coral habitat has now disappeared. The hotels are based on discarded crab traps covered with sponges and algae, providing seahorses with both camouflage and a source of food. Well, in case you missed it, SBS Television won the 2019 Australian Skeptic Spent Spoon Award for the biggest pile of pseudoscientific piffle of the year for their show Medicine or Myth, which clearly demonstrates how poor broadcasting and bad journalism places good science second to bad entertainment. Well, New Zealand sceptics have their own version of the Bent Spoon Awards, and their 2019 winner was the Wellington City Council for demonstrating the most egregious gullibility over the past year. Tim Mendham from Australian Skeptics says the Kiwi Council won the dubious accolade for its contractors' use of water divining to try and find underground pipes. In this case, it went to a Wellington City Council for one of its contractors using divining rods to try and find water pipes, etc. They thought that was very strange. Wellington City Council said, thank you very much. We actually don't want this award. <laughs> they were quite uh, restrained, actually, in, uh, in uh, accepting it. They just... Uh, and they said it's not our fault. And basically, they said it's a contractor that we use, and the contractor was quite uh, even-handed about it, if you like, but he said, oh, yeah, some of us use it. Yeah, it's, it's, it's not foolproof, but I'm, I'm told it's, it works, that sort of thing. So um, it's a strange thing. It happens in various councils around the place, people trying to find water or electricity lines or that sort of thing by using dowsing. There's no evidence it works apart from the uh, practitioners swearing by it. And there might be various reasons why it works for them, but it's, it's whenever it's been tested scientifically, it uh, it doesn't work. I remember when I was first starting out in radio many, many years ago, one of our biggest sponsors for our show was a drilling company that drilled for water. This is in central western New South Wales. And uh, their method of finding where to drill was using divining rods. Of course, the fact is the water table is everywhere, so you're going to hit water eventually. It's just a question of how deep you have to go to get there. So I always thought that was rather amusing, but... Uh, Again, they swore by it. They thought it was it was just a fact. This is how it works. Yeah, I mean, sort of, uh, we believe that all the diviners we've tested, we've tested over 100, that they, they, they genuinely believe yeah. that they're not sort of yeah, fakes, they're not shonks, in other words, yeah, who are trying to make a buck by ripping people off. They certainly believe they can do it, and perhaps they do do it. As you say, there's a, a water table underneath a lot of places in Australia, and you just have to keep drilling down until you find it, hopefully. It's amazing that how often a psychic will say, he drill down here and it doesn't work. But nonetheless, there might be various reasons, like they just know the landscape, they understand how water sort of collects underground, that sort of thing. People who talk about there being streams underground is a bit of a problem because it tends to be water tables, rather than sort of still water, rather than uh, flushing rivers, as you might sort of picture in a cave or something like that. So when they talk about movement of water, you start wondering about it. But, I mean, they've used every sort of... Yeah, the standard divining rod is is a bit of metal or or a twig that's uh, bent into a Y shape and it's sort of 
goes up and down depending on uh, whether there's water there or not. I'm never quite sure if it's up is water or down is water. People seem to have a different view. Oh, these ones we're using uh, two L-shaped metal rods, and one was held in each hand very loosely, and as the dude doing the divining, I don't know if that makes him a divine dude, but as the guy doing the divining <laughs> walked along, these rods would move, and when they cross, that's where the water was. Or at least yeah, they hope. Yeah, I try that too. They, they often put the small L shape, which is held in the hand, inside a tube. So, oh, so yeah. it actually moves more easily rather than in your fist, which is, can be a bit sticky. And that means that it can move a lot more easily. And all you have to do is sort of tip your arm or your hand even slightly, and the wires will move. I've seen, I've seen people use cubes, dice, cricket balls on a string. In one test, someone used his son on his shoulder, who, if the kid started squirming, there was water. We need, or he needed to go to the toilet. I'm not quite sure. Well, there was water. Was <laughs> yeah, as you say, so the, the, uh, the Kiwis gave this award to, to the Wellington Council. Wellington Council said, well, we, we really don't want it. Uh, they also said that most of us don't believe it, but it's the contractor who's using it, and they said it's not costing us any money anyway, so why not? That's Tim Mindham from Australian Skeptics. And that's the show for now. You can subscribe and download Space Time as a free twice-weekly podcast through Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Bytes.com, Pocket Casts, SoundCloud, YouTube, Audioboom, from SpaceTimeWithStewartGary.com, or from your favourite podcast download provider. If you want more Space Time, check out our blog, where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as loads of images, news stories, videos, and things on the web that I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word and in lowercase, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us through at Stuart Gary on Twitter, at Spacetime with Stuart Gary on Instagram, on Facebook, just go to www.facebook.com slash Spacetime with Stuart Gary, and you can also find us on the Spacetime with Stuart Gary YouTube channel. Spacetime is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You've been listening to Space Time with Stuart Gary. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com. 